So I don't know whether on Thursday of this past week you thought anything about what a meaning that day is to Seventh-day Adventists. If you didn't, uh, well, I'm going to remind you today because on Thursday it was 176 years to the day when our pioneers expected Jesus to come. And that morning as they woke up, it was the happiest day of their life. They expected that Jesus would arrive during that day. And when they went to bed, which was for many was after midnight, some stayed up all night, it was the saddest day of their entire life because Jesus did not come. And of course, Many people accuse Seventh-day Adventists of being false prophets, but it really shows they don't know what they're talking about. Because if you had asked the disciples what was going to be the outcome of Jesus' visit to earth, they would have said, he's going to become king. But instead, he was crucified, and they were totally discouraged about it. So we're in good company as Seventh-day Adventists to be among the descendants of the Millerites, which was one of the greatest revivals in all history. That was on October 22, 1844, that that happened. Now here were the key texts that they understood. Uh, Daniel 8 verse 14 says, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now all the Protestant churches taught that the cleansing, that the earth was the sanctuary, and so they assumed that it meant Jesus was coming to this earth to purify the earth. And also Daniel 9.25 Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem and they discovered that that command to restore Jerusalem was in the Bible and that it took place in 457 B.C. So it was just a matter of arithmetic, and they figured out that the end of the 2,300 days would be, in, at first they thought it was 1843, because they didn't re remember or realize that there was a zero year between B.C. and A.D. In other words, they counted down, you know, four, five, uh, or excuse me, five, four, three, two, one, and then they started again with one. So there was no zero year. To make the math work between the two uh, periods, they would have to have a zero year. So once they figured that out, then they knew it was uh, 1844, and they were able to figure the exact date of October 22. And the message they preached, they found in Revelation 14, verse 7, the hour of his judgment is come. Now this, uh, again, was because there is a judgment when Jesus comes. We call it the executive judgment or the delivery of the judgment of how the judgment has turned out. Uh, they just thought that's what was being predicted, but later uh, discovered, no, just like all good court trials on earth, there is an investigation first before we go to court. And so that has been called the investigative judgment and uh, happens before uh, Jesus returns to this earth. In fact, it started 
on October 22, 1844. Now I'd like to spend a few minutes on the kind of man that God chose to lead this tremendous revival. He never became a Seventh-day Adventist, but uh, some of his followers did. And in the book Great Controversy, page 317, it says, His mind was active and well-developed, and he had a keen thirst for knowledge. Though he did not enjoy the advantages of a collegiate education, his love of study and a habit of careful thought and close criticism rendered him a man of sound judgment and comprehensive views. So he was a good student, although he had no college degree. And a lot of people felt the same as some do today. If you don't have a college degree or a university degree, then what good are you or how could you possibly know? But you know, as you study Bible prophecy and the different revivals that took place in the Bible, most of the time he did not pick college graduates. Most of the time he picked what we call laymen. But they have to be of this kind. He was, you know, willing to study hard. He was willing to do his best. And of course, at first he wasn't studying the Bible, but later he got introduced. And that's also in the same book, page 319. This is a William Miller speaking himself. I saw that the Bible did bring to view just such a savior as I needed. And I was perplexed to find how an uninspired book should develop principles so perfectly adapted to the wants of a fallen world. So he had listened to other people who claimed the Bible wasn't inspired and he had adopted that line of reasoning. I was constrained to admit that the scriptures must be a revelation from God. They became my delight, and in Jesus I found a friend. The Savior became to me the cheapest among 10,000. Is that what Jesus means to you this morning? Does he feel like he is the cheap, or do you feel that he is the cheapest among 10,000, the one that you most long to learn about and to talk about and to have working in your life? If so, then you're a good descendant of William Miller and the others who were the same. Then it says, <clears throat> the Bible now became my chief study. And I can truly say, I searched it with great delight. I lost all taste for other reading and applied my heart to get wisdom from God. Now to apply this to ourselves, which I, I believe that we're supposed to apply everything we study from God's word, uh, we're going to have to change it a little bit because people don't read much anymore except they read from the internet. What about laying aside the internet and laying aside the cell phone and only studying the Bible? Do you think that a revival might occur? Just like happened to William Miller? This is how I believe the enemy, and I'm not saying we should never uh, get any benefit from these tools, but I believe this is the greatest hindrance. It's not books. It's not the reading of books today or magazines, but this is what is the barrier to getting people that get like William Miller so that God can really change this world again. And so... Uh, once it gets to the place where our favorite thing to do is to study the Bible, 
And guess what? God will use us to turn the world upside down. Endeavoring to lay aside all preconceived opinions. That's the thing that's hard for people to do. And the group that it's hardest to do it is the pastors and the professors, the theology professors. And that's probably why God picked a lay person and he was successful in saying, okay, I'm going to study the Bible with an open mind. I'm not going to try to interpret the Bible according to my preconceived ideas. Endeavoring to lay aside all preconceived opinions and dispensing with commentaries so he didn't even want to use what so-called great men thought about the Bible. He compared scripture with scripture by the aid of the marginal references in the concordance. He pursued his study in a regular and methodical manner, beginning with Genesis and reading verse by verse. He proceeded no faster than the meaning of the several passages so unfolded as to leave him free from all embarrassment. So he could explain it to anybody, any verse that he passed by, he wanted to be able to explain it to anyone. Whenever he met with a passage hard to be understood, he found an explanation in some other portion of scripture. So he discovered that the Bible is a self-explanatory book and that if you will look in other places, it will explain what it means. Well, he really got tested when he came to the book of Daniel, but by then his method had been very well uh, learned. And an interesting story arises in regard to this and the story occurred after he had been a, a lecturer in you know many many cities and he was looked upon as an incredible speaker and one day a visitor came to his home and they wanted to see Miller but he was not there and so they thought well at least I would like to see his library. And they were envisioning this vast library of books because Miller seemed to know so much about the Bible. And so the daughter of Miller, Miller uh, escorted the visitor into the library. And the only books in the library was the Bible and Cruden's Concordance, nothing else. And they were shocked. But you know, the biggest problem today, and sad to say, even in theology schools, they spend very little time studying the Bible, and they spend their time studying what men have said about the Bible, and this is the result. Why there's so many confused ideas in regard to what the Bible teaches today. But God chose William Miller, who wouldn't do that, and hadn't done that to be able to get the Bible straight at least in many many uh, ways which other people uh, did not. Now his discovery was predicted in the Bible in Daniel 12 verse 4. It says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. So after Daniel is given all these visions, which, by the way, we're giving on Friday nights down in our city center. But God said, seal it up, even to the time of the end. So when the time of the end comes, it's to be unsealed. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Now that phrase has been misunderstood by an awful lot of people. It's not talking about airplanes and computers and all the advances that have been made. It's talking about that people's knowledge 
in regard to the book of Daniel and in regard to the last days would be greatly increased. And people would get an urgency to know what God was talking about. And so they would study the Bible like Miller. They'd read in Genesis, they'd read in Jeremiah, they'd read in Revelation. They're, they would be studying all over the Bible to understand the book of Daniel, especially in the book of Revelation. Also later in the chapter, it says, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. So I said, Daniel, I'm sorry, I, I'm not going to explain it all to you, but someday in the end, it's going to be open and people are going to understand twice. In a very short chapter, God made that plain. Well, Miller was the man chosen to be used of God to open the book of Daniel to the world. Another text that became very important to them is found in Habakkuk 2, <clears throat> verses 2 and 3. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. So here Habakkuk is told, I want you to write down what I showed to you. It needs to be plain upon tables because the person that reads it is supposed to understand it and be able to run. Well, there's no time when that text fit better than to the book of Daniel. And so uh, Daniel wrote it down, and the book of Daniel could be understood by careful Bible study. <coughs> also, it points out that this particular book of Daniel would be understood at the appointed time. And definitely it was. As I mentioned, the message that they realized we are supposed to give to the world is found in Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. Now, it's not a literal angel here, but it's talking about a message and it is supposed to fly, not crawl. And I don't think I have to remind you that it doesn't take 176 years to get ready for Jesus coming. But it hasn't been flying. That's the problem. But it was flying during the Millerite movement. In fact, within uh, just a few years, less than 30 years, this message went to every single Christian on planet Earth. And I don't know, you know, I don't think it made its way to every non-Christian person, but it, it covered the globe in just a few years, and everyone knew, and every Christian had to make a decision whether they were going to listen to this message or not. And then it tells what the message was, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. Now there's many aspects of the everlasting gospel, but I am sure the most exciting one is the second coming of Jesus. Because we've all had enough of this world. If you haven't, you soon will. So that is a wonderful message. And it's to go to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice. In other words, it needs to be crystal clear so that they can make a decision. With a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Now, the, the rest of it they didn't understand, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. That's a direct quote from the fourth commandment. 
And, you know, pastors of many churches are saying there is no command to keep the fourth commandment, the seventh day Sabbath, in the New Testament. That's what they're saying. But they're speaking from a vast background of ignorance. Because here is a direct command that it's time for God's people to return to the keeping of the fourth commandment. As I said, the Millerites didn't grasp that, but those who followed after them did, and that's all a part of the message that was being delivered. Now here, uh, in a, a book by one of our pioneers, Elder Loughborough, he wrote a book called The Se uh, Second... Well, it'll, it'll come here in a minute. He said the proclamation by the Adventist people was not simply the announcement made by Paul before Felix. Here's a quote, what Paul said. Righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. So Paul spoke to Felix about judgment. Nor was it the statement made by Martin Luther after having completed the translation of the Bible. When a short time before his death, he reported to have said, he is reported to have said, quote, I am persuaded that the judgment is not far off. Yea, that the Lord himself will not be absent above 300 years longer. Interesting, he wasn't too far off. Neither was it the statement made by John Wesley when he said, he, and quote again, thought the millennium might commence in about 100 years. The Adventists claim to be giving the message symbolized in Revelation 14, 6, and 7, where it says the hour of his judgment is come. Notice it doesn't say will come, uh, might come, or any of that, is come. And the cry of Revelation 10.6, time shall be no longer. In other words, after 1844, time is not an issue. Jesus can come any time after 1844. Time shall be no longer. Such a prophecy could not be accomplished by an announcement of an event that was to come, coming in 300 years, or in 100 years, but in definite time, is come. Just such a message with just such definiteness as that demanded by the above prophecies was heralded by the Adventist people to the whole world. That which gave force to the message and most mightily moved the people was the proclamation of definite time. I uh, suppose that that cured all the procrastinators. I hope you're not a procrastinator because this time we're not going to have a definite time. And so no procrastinator will get ready. If we put it off, we just won't get ready. But if we believe that Jesus is coming very soon, then we're going to get busy getting ready so that we can fulfill what Jesus said to be ready. Now, the Lord put his stamp of approval on them, not just because they could defend their positions from the Bible, but because of his testimony from heaven. And this is uh, some of what happened is in Revelation 6, verses 12 to 14. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. 
even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll. Now that is the second coming of Jesus. And these three signs that God said he would give to them to know that the end is near is predicted in the Bible. And uh, you can find them in a number of sources, but there was the Lisbon earthquake that took place in 1755. Now that was before Miller was preaching, but in those days when Miller was preaching, everybody knew about that tremendous earthquake in Lisbon. Then the sun was darkened and the moon turned to blood in May 19, 1780, which again was a warning that Jesus' coming is very near. And the third one, the falling of stars, took place right during the Millerite preaching on November 13, 1833. And then they had another amazing uh, support from heaven that they were on the right track in Revelation 9, we don't have time to study that chapter today, but in Revelation 9, there is a description of the conquering and the period of time that the Muslim would be in control. And therefore, it predicted the actual day that they would fall from power. And one of the Millerite preachers in studying that chapter, discovered it's going to happen on August 11, 1840. And the incredible thing was, it happened on that exact day. And so God used these signs to tell people, you better listen to the, to the Millerites. They've got it straight. And uh, yet many people did not. Now, Many of you have heard of all those, but here's some that I had never heard of before. This first one happened on January 25, 1837. There was a most magnificent display of the fiery Aurora Borealis, which seemed to lead the minds of many directly to the prophet Joel's prediction of what was to precede the great day of the Lord. The following description of the scene is from the New York Commercial Advisor of October 22, 1839. Here's a quote. On the evening of January 25, 1837, there was a remarkable exhibition of the same phenomena, meaning the aurora borealis, in various parts of the country as our readers will doubtless recollect. Where the ground was covered with snow, the sight was grand and fearful in a most unprecedented manner. In one place situated near a mountain, the people who witnessed the scene informed us that it resembled waves of fire rolling down the mountain. And generally, so far as learned, the snow covering the ground appeared like fire mingled with blood. While above, as the apostle says, the heavens being on fire. That's what Joel says is going to happen. And they saw it happen. Resembled as much the prophetic description of the last day that many were amazed. The children beholding it were affrighted and inquired if it were the coming of the judgment. And even the animals trembled with much manifest alarm. So here's another sign that God gave and uh, people got the message. You know, that's one of the key points to me is they got the message. Jesus is coming. It's the end. And so when he gives signs, people understand. Some may scoff, but many people, they get the point. 
because God does it in such a way that they can't miss it. Here's another one that happened in London on September 5, 1839. Between the hours of 10 on Thursday night and 3 yesterday morning, <coughs> in the heavens was observed one of the most magnificent specimens of these extraordinary phenomena. The falling stars and northern lights witnessed for many years past. The first indication of this singular phenomenon was 10 minutes before 10, when a light crimson apparently vapor rose from the northern portion of the hemisphere and gradually extended to the center of the heavens. And by 10 o'clock or quarter past, the whole from east to west was one vast sheet of light. It had a most alarming appearance and was exactly like that occasioned by a terrific fire. The light varied considerable. At one time it seemed to fall and directly after rose with intense brightness. There were to be seen, mingled with it, volumes of smoke, which rolled over and over, and every beholder seemed convinced that it was a tremendous conflagration. The consternation of the metropolis was very great. Thousands of persons were running in the direction of the supposed awful catastrophe the engines belonging to the fire brigade stations in Baker Street, Farthington Street, Watling Street, Waterloo Road, and likewise those belonging to the west of London stations. In fact, every fire engine in London was horsed and galloped after the supposed scene of destruction. With more than ordinary energy, followed by carriages, horsemen, and vast mobs. Some of the engines proceeded as far as Highgate and Holloway, about four miles, before the error was discovered. These appearances lasted for upwards of two hours, and toward morning the spectacle became one of grandeur. Wow. I'd never heard of those experiences before, but they were equally impressive for those that were involved. And this group, all these people, all these fire engines arrived there. There was no fire. It was all something that God had done to get their attention and to warn them. At two o'clock in the morning, the phenomenon presented a most gorgeous scene and one very difficult to describe. The whole of London was illuminated as light as noonday, and the atmosphere was remarkably clear. Amazing. As I close with this verse, Revelation 10, verse 11, And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. The Millerite movement ended, but God brought out of the Millerite movement those who would start the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And the instruction that God has given to us you must do again what the Millerites did once before. Based on that little book, the book of Daniel, it's not a very big book, it's a small book, only a few pages, but that book must be presented to the world again because although we can't predict any definite time when Jesus is going to come, he is coming and the judgment is taking place. It's not in the future. The judgment is come. It is going on. And soon, 
Every person's destiny will be decided and Jesus will come. This message we've been, uh, we haven't given it with the energy or with the thoroughness that we should have given it, but it's a call for us every October 22. Let's, it's time to get with it and to give this message with the same power. And I believe when God sees his people giving this message with the same power, he's going to give more signs and evidences that this is his message for this hour. And so we are at a very important time of earth's history. May we be faithful, as faithful as they were, in giving it in their time. And this time, uh, we won't be disappointed because we have a better grasp on the Bible, on some of the details that God didn't intend really for them to understand. It wasn't time for them, but it is time for us.